All right, so I started the recording and I think we can begin. Um, Susan, is that okay? Great. All right, perfect. So um, just good morning uh, on the West Coast and good afternoon on the East Coast, whoever is joining us. Uh, thank you so much for being on this webinar uh, this afternoon. It's a very important topic. You know, um, Student Supporting Israel was established 12 years ago because there are many issues on college campuses. However, this academic year, after October 7th, the level of anti-Israel protests and the propaganda we've been seeing and anti-Semitism on college campuses has really crossed many lines. Uh, it is really unprecedented. And just an hour ago, I got a newsletter into my mailbox from the Anti-Semitism Research Center saying that there is over 800% rise in campus anti-Semitic incidents. And what is happening right now in academic institutions, it's definitely getting a national attention. And there are many issues that come up, not just related to actions that can be taken on campus or what is it can we do, uh, where should we send an email, but there are actually a lot of legal issues too. And we've been seeing violations of Title VI, we've been seeing assaults, trespassing, arrests on college campuses, you know, just earlier this week, I co-signed a letter sent to state attorney's office calling to take actions that will be more of a deterrence to those who spread anti-Semitic messages on campuses and participate in vandalism. And so today to talk about all these issues, we have Susan Tokman, um, who is the director of the Center for Law and Justice uh, of the Zionist Organization of America. And I know just yesterday, the COA also sent an open letter to the Attorney General and some other parties calling for investigation and prosecution of different groups uh, who are participating in this violence and hate on campus. So, you know, I want to say without further ado, just give the stage to Susan to speak about all these legal aspects of the current situation on college campuses. And please, if you have any questions, you have the Q&A button. Um, I think at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So if you can just write your questions as we go, and at the end, I will try to choose some of the questions that Susan did not touch upon to um, ask her, and we can get these answered for you, hopefully. Uh, so thank you, Susan. Thank you, Valeria. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, I'm sure many of you on the call who are students have uh, have encountered anti-Semitism on your campus. Maybe you've witnessed it. Maybe you yourself have endured it. Um, the problems on campus are surging. They're alarming. They're scary. Um, and they're unacceptable. And I'm here to tell you today that the good news is, is that you have legal resource. Uh, recourse. You have legal tools out there to help you address campus anti-Semitism. You have the right under the law to a safe environment, an environment that feels safe to you psychologically and physically, and you have the right to be proudly and openly Jewish on your campus without any worry or any fear. I'm going to talk to you about some of the legal tools that are available to you, but I want to suggest to you first that you may not even need to resort to a legal action. You may be able to get your school to enforce its own rules and policies to effectively address anti-Semitism. Valeria mentioned how the problem is surging on campuses today, and that's true. Um, ZOA has been fighting campus anti-Semitism for many years. Um, it's a large part of the work that I do at the ZOA. And in all of that time, I have yet to come across a college or a university that does not have a student code of conduct. And many of you probably are familiar with your own school's code of conduct. Um, these codes typically tell students what behaviors are expected of them. And the codes of conduct will also tell you what behaviors are prohibited and subject to discipline. These codes of conduct don't just apply to students, they apply to student organizations. And these codes of conduct probably prohibit much of the anti-Semitism that we've been seeing on college campuses over the past several months. For example, 
physical threats would be prohibited under codes of conduct, physical assaults, damaging and destroying property, interfering with normal school operations, disrupting university activities, school events, classes, all of those behaviors would typically be prohibited under a school's code of conduct. These codes of conduct also have specific provisions that prohibit bullying, harassment, intimidation. So if you do experience anti-Semitism on your campus, it's at least worth a try to bring those problems to your administration's attention, identify the problems, identify the code provisions that you believe have been violated, and report the harassment and discrimination. It could be to the Office of Student Affairs or whatever office in your school that deals with bias and discrimination complaints. And when you make your complaint, I would suggest to you that it's important to make it in writing. You wanna create a record, pull together all of the evidence of the anti-Semitism that you're complaining about. So if you have photos, if you have videos, put them together, retain them, provide them to the school. If you have witnesses who can corroborate that the anti-Semitism occurred, gather your witnesses and file your complaint. If you don't hear back from the school, follow up again in writing. Do whatever you can to compel your school to enforce its own rules and policies. And when you're doing that, consider that some of the behavior that we're seeing on campus could be criminal. It could violate our criminal laws. For example, vandalizing property, physically threatening someone, physically assaulting somebody, uh, trespassing, those could be violations of criminal law as well. So if your university isn't acting on those behaviors, bring it to your school's attention, encourage your school to report the conduct to law enforcement and file your own police report. And I'm not saying that these efforts are necessarily going to be successful. Quite often they're not, but it's good to be able to show in the event that you resort to a legal action that you've at least made these informal efforts, you've put your school on notice that these violations have occurred and that the school has not effectively responded. So let's say you've made all these informal efforts and your school has failed to respond to the harassment and discrimination that you're encountering as a Jew on campus. What do you do? Well, as I said at the beginning, you have legal rights under the law. If you take away one thing from today's webinar, remember this, you are protected from anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination under a federal law called Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Publicly funded schools are obligated under Title VI to protect you from anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Title VI. I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds. Um, Title VI was passed back in 1964. It's a federal law and it was passed primarily to address racial discrimination, but it does more than that. Essentially, the law says that if you receive federal funding and all public colleges and universities receive federal funding and most private ones do too, if you receive federal funding, then you are required to ensure that your programs and activities are free from discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. And this applies to all publicly funded schools. And schools have a real incentive to comply with Title VI because if they're found to have violated the law, they could risk losing their federal funding. So the agency in the government that's responsible for enforcing Title VI is called the Office for Civil Rights, or we call it OCR for short. And OCR is in the United States Department of Education. And OCR is responsible for ensuring that your colleges and universities live up to their legal obligations under Title VI. 
And not to go too much into the detail, but I will tell you that historically, OCR was not enforcing Title VI to protect Jewish students. The agency said that Jewish students were not protected under the law, and here's why. The law protects against discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. That's the language of the law. And what is missing from the law? The law does not protect against discrimination based on religion. And the Office for Civil Rights said, well, Jews are a religious group, and therefore they're outside the protections of Title VI. But all of us know that Jews are not just, we don't just constitute a religious group, we're also an ethnic group, right? We, we don't just share a religion, we share um, a language, we share a homeland, we share a culture, an ancestry, a tra all, all, uh, traditions, all the qualities and characteristics that make us not only a religious group, but an ethnic group too. And ZOA, my organization, led what was a six-year battle to make sure that Jewish students were protected under Title VI. And finally, in 2010, the Office for Civil Rights issued a great policy letter. And in the letter, OCR said that there are certain groups, including Jews, who are not only religious groups, but they're ethnic groups too, and they therefore cannot be denied the protections of Title VI. So that policy actually benefited not only Jews, it protected um, Arabs, Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, groups that are not only religious groups, but ethnic groups too. It's important to know, though, that Title VI does not protect you against uh, strictly religious discrimination, if it was something having to do with your ability to uh, religiously observe Jewish holidays, for example, that's outside the scope of Title VI protections. But if you, dis if you experience discrimination or harassment based on your Jewish ancestry or your Jew Jewish ethnicity, then Title VI applies and Title VI protects you. And that's good news because the kind of harassment and intimidation that we're seeing on college campuses today um, is really based on Jewish ethnicity and ancestry. So you've got this protection under Title VI, and I, and I want to describe to you the two basic Title VI claims that you might be able to make. Um, one is a claim that you are being subjected to what's called a hostile environment based on your Jewish ancestry or ethnicity. So it's a hostile environment claim. And, and how would you establish that kind of claim? Well, OCR says that a hostile environment is unwelcome conduct that is subjectively and objectively offensive and is so severe persistent or, per or pervasive that it interferes with your ability to participate fully in school activities or to benefit from the education program at your school. And if you're subjected to a hostile environment in violation of Title VI, what is your school obligated to do under the law? Well, your school is obligated to take prompt and effective steps not only to eliminate the hostile environment, but to ensure that it doesn't recur. So that's the standard. That's a hostile environment claim under Title VI. You might have what's called a disparate or a different treatment claim. And that's essentially that a claim that your school is treating you differently from other similarly, similarly situated students to you based on your Jewish ancestry or your ethnicity. And I'm gonna give you a hypothetical example of how that might play out to be a disparate treatment claim. Um, let's say you're taking a, a politics class um, and the, uh, the war against Hamas comes up in the class and your professor 
singles out in the class students who the professor knows are Jewish or perceives them to be Jewish. And he singles those students out in the classroom and demands that they condemn Israel. And no other students are singled out in the class, only those who are actually Jewish or who are perceived to be Jewish. That could form the basis of what's called a disparate treatment claim under Title VI. So you've got these two potential claims under the law, disparate treatment, hostile environment complaint. What do you do? How do you file your complaint? Well, it's pretty easy. Um, the Office for Civil Rights has a website. You just Google Department of Education, Office for Civil Rights. They have a website and there's actually an online complaint form that you can use to file your complaint. Another option available to you is to send a letter, just a simple letter to the Office for Civil Rights outlining what you've experienced and asking the Office for Civil Rights for help. And again, you can go to the OCR website, but you can file that letter um, with the Office for Civil Rights main headquarters in Washington, DC. And OCR also has regional offices all across the country. So they have a New York office if you're attending a New York school, but it's very easy and you don't have to include all that much, just enough facts to alert the Office for Civil Rights to the problem that you are experiencing. Or you can come to an organization like ZOA um, we hear from students all the time. This is a large part of the work that I do at the ZOA. Um, if you're experiencing a problem and you want help in determining whether or not there's enough information to file a complaint, you need help in filing a complaint, that's exactly the kind of work we do. We're a resource to you. And you should know that you do not, as the injured party, have to file your own complaint. Anyone can file a Title VI complaint with the Office for Civil Rights. So the injured party does not have to be the complaining party. When ZOA files complaints, when students come to us with problems and we see that it's a, a Title VI complaint is justified, we file the complaint, ZOA is the complaining party. And that's sort of a protection for students so that they don't have to be identified. So that's one legal option. That's what I would call an administrative complaint that you can file with the Office for Civil Rights. But you have another legal option. You can file a lawsuit. You can file a lawsuit with a court. Um, and the case might be heard by a judge or maybe even a jury, uh, depending on the nature of the claims that you filed. So it's a judge or a jury deciding the case, not the Office for Civil Rights. Filing a lawsuit could be a more expensive option. Also, you should know that if you're filing a complaint in court, it's the injured party who is the complaining party. So it's a little bit different from what could happen in a complaint that you file with the Office for Civil Rights. What kind of com claims could you file in a court? Well, you can file a Title VI claim with a court too. Um, you may have other claims depending on the facts of your case. Um, the facts may justify, for example, just a hypothetical, uh, a breach of contract claim. You might be able to argue that you have a contractual relationship with your university, that you have agreed to attend the university and pay tuition and uh comply with the university's rules and policies. And in turn, the university through its materials and the documents it's provided to you has agreed to keep you safe and to provide you with a safe environment. Potentially you could argue that the, university's has, the university has breached its duties to you. Um, so it really depends on the facts of your case but you can proceed with an administrative complaint with the Office for Civil Rights or a lawsuit in a court. 
I will tell you that it can happen that you can resolve these cases short of filing a legal action with OCR or in a court. We've had instances where students have come to us with problems that they need help in addressing. We've written detailed letters to their school, laying out the nature of the problems, reminding the school of its obligations under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, and recommending to the school steps that the school can take to fulfill its obligations under the law. And sometimes that works. It doesn't happen often, but it can. So that's an option as well, short of filing a legal action. That's it in a nutshell. And you know, you may walk away and feel like you've retained nothing of what I, I've said today, and that's okay. Um, remember Title VI, keep that in your heads. And remember too, that you have a legal right to a safe environment, an environment that feels safe to you physically and psychologically, and that is not hostile to you as a Jew and a supporter of Israel. If you retain that much, that is great. And remember this, we're a resource for you. I can't emphasize that enough. I get called so often every week by students, by parents, um, by members of the community. This is the work that we do every day. You can reach out to me anytime. Uh, I'm gonna give you my contact information and I'm hoping that Valeria can post it. Um, my email address is super easy. It's my first initial and last name. So it's S Tuckman, T-U-C-H-M-A-N at ZOA.org. Or you can call me at ZOA. My phone number is 212-481-1500. I am a resource. I'm here to help you and support you. We have another great resource at ZOA. Many of you may know about it already. We have a campus department led by my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Jonathan Ginsberg. Um, our campus department is called ZOA Campus, and it is an incredible resource to students. Um, we do programming on campuses across the country to educate students about Israel and to make sure that when you hear lies about Israel, when you talk about Israel, you can be informed and confident and effective advocates for the Jewish state. Our campus department also helps students who are facing anti-Semitism on their campuses, maybe before they come to me. Um, lots of times students work with our campus department to fight back against um, BDS and other anti-Israel initiatives. So our campus department is a wonderful resource. Um, in terms of other resources to you, the Office for Civil Rights website is a great resource. Their materials are very readable. They have fact sheets, there are letters. Um, just Google Office for Civil Rights Department of Education and you'll have lots of information at your disposal. Just two days ago, um, the Office for Civil Rights issued a very detailed letter about Title VI, what it is, how OCR enforces it, what types of claims can be made under Title VI. And this new letter actually provides hypothetical situations that could give rise to a Title VI violation. So I'm sure it's on the OCR website if you wanna look for it, or reach out to me, I will send you the letter. I'm happy to share it with you. The, the only other thing I really wanna share with you today before we, we take questions is I, I, I know this is not an easy time to be Jewish and pro-Israel on campus. Um, it, it's scary, it's alarming, um, but, but please know you have allies. You have many allies. You have a lot of support. When I say that, I include the wonderful organization SSI, who is sponsoring this webinar today. 
And I'm also including my wonderful organization, the Zionist Organization of America. We are here to help you. We're here to support you, answer questions, and make sure that you have the kind of campus environment that every single student deserves, one that's safe and one that's welcoming to you. Um, happy to take questions. And for any of you who want to follow up with me later, please do so. I look forward to talking to you. Thank you so much, Susan. So uh, we actually have a lot of questions. And uh, I see some here on the Q&A and others that I uh, got person personally uh, messaged to me. So I'll try to combine a few if there are any repetitions, but I'll just start. Um, basically, so Title VI, you mentioned this is applies to public universities, but is there anything to do with private universities? Like what, what um, about oh, I'm, private I, universities? I'm so glad you're bringing this up, Valeria, because I think I said this, but if I wasn't clear, my apologies. Title VI, of course, applies to public universities, but it applies to any university, any school that gets federal funding and almost all private schools get federal funding. So privates and publics have to comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. If any of them receive any sort of federal funding, they're obligated to comply with this law. Thank you for, for helping me emphasize that point. It's important. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. Now, another question was, um, what to do with the issue of professors who are also being um, part of the, you know, maybe incitement or things. Um, I, I personally heard from our students that some professors were canceling classes and in a way encouraging people to join the encampment. The question is what to do with tenured professors? Is there anything specifically uh, or any way specifically to address professors or is it all part of the creating hostile environment and just addressing the university. Exactly, exactly. I would say that those situations that you are describing are part of your claim that you're enduring a hostile environment at your school in violation of Title VI. I mean, the hypothetical example that I gave you earlier about the professor who singled out students in class, that's happened. Um, so that would be not a hostile environment complaint necessarily, but it would be um, a disparate or different treatment claim, but also a claim under Title VI. So any conduct that your professors are engaging in that are helping to create an environment that feels hostile to you as a Jew um, would go into your complaint against the office for, uh, to the Office for Civil Rights under Title VI. Um. Thank you for explaining. Now, another question here is about um, a loss. So a lawsuit was filed against Columbia University in 2019 and still awaiting a response. It's according to the comment. Now, I know that actually, um, I guess, very recently, a class action was filed also against Columbia University on behalf of Jewish students. I think it was just uh, last week, if I'm not mistaken, um, that was you know, very recent too. And the question is, are lawsuits actually um, work working? So is there anything positive that we, like any resolution uh, with the university? So what is the outcome of these lawsuits? You know, as far as I know, none of these lawsuits that have been filed certainly since, well, since October 7th, they're still pending, but a lot of these cases drag on for a long time. And I'm being totally frank with, with uh, the audience here. Um, ZOA really pioneered the use of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to protect Jewish students. Um, I think we filed the first case of campus anti-Semitism under Title VI that the Office for Civil Rights ever agreed to enforce. Um, but in my experience, these cases are taking way too long for OCR to resolve. Um, I recognize that OCR probably has a flood of complaints. Um, maybe there are staffing issues, but these take cases are taking, at least the cases that we have, are taking longer than I would like to have seen for there to be um, an effective resolution that ensures that Jewish students are protected. And that may, we, may well be true for lawsuits too. So it's, 
potentially a very effective tool, this Title VI, but practically speaking, I've come to have some reservations about how much it actually can accomplish because it does take so long for these cases to get resolved. Not always, but that seems to be the pattern. Now, um, there is a question here that says that UNC Chapel Hill, it was placed under the um, UCR uh, resolution, so under the Office for Civil Rights resolution in 2019 for three years, but the antisemitic behavior continues. So what is the next step after this? Uh, at which stage potentially funding is being uh, withheld or what, what is the next stage here? Well, this this is a case that um, that illustrates the problem that I just identified for you. Whoever asked that question may know that the university, this is UNC at Chapel Hill, uh, entered into what's called a resolution agreement with the with the Office for Civil Rights back in 2019, and basically it's an agreement that sets out steps that the university agrees to take under OCR's supervision. And that resolution agreement was triggered by a Title VI complaint that the ZOA filed against the university. So that was our case. Within months of the resolution agreement, the university violated the resolution agreement. And we immediately notified the Office for Civil Rights of the violation and the nature of the violation. And there the case sits to this day. And uh, to me, that is sort of illustrates the problem that we have in getting these universities to actually comply with their legal obligations. Those resolution agreements don't say that the university violated the law. They never get to that point. The university enters into these resolution agreements, I think, to avoid a finding that they violated Title VI, but they agree to take certain steps. And yet we see in the UNC at Chapel Hill situation that even after the university agreed and then failed to follow through, the university still has not been held accountable by OCR. So it's a problem. So what, um, another question here, I guess maybe a follow up on that. Um, is there, so these complaints, they're being filed on behalf of students. Is there anything that parents uh, can do? You did mention that anyone can file a complaint, but is there anything else maybe that the parents can do in terms of, um, I don't know, the directing uh, efforts towards uh, university presidents or board of regents or some sort of um, advocacy on behalf of the Jewish students? It's, it's a great question, Valeria. And I think there are a lot of things that parents can do um, and that I would do if I were a parent and my child was experiencing anti-Semitism. I would reach out to university leaders and we've worked with parents that have done just that reach out to the regents, board of trustees, withhold donations, contact your members of Congress, your representatives in Congress, and let them know that your children are facing anti-Semitism, that they're trying to get these problems resolved and they haven't been able to do it. They've, they've, uh, they've tried these legal channels and um, they're not working as effectively as they should. Um, if you're an alum of a school um, where there are anti-Semitism problems, withhold your donations. Um, I know my my school where I graduated from, Brandeis University, Brandeis, um, after October 7th, banned Students for Justice in Palestine uh, on the campus based on the hate and bigotry that that group was promoting on the campus. Um, and I made a point of letting my um, my alma mater know that I supported the action and I would continue to support the school because it was doing the right thing. So those are very important steps that parents can take. And another follow-up question on that, what would you suggest to students who are facing issues with their peers? So for example, uh, cases like um, a roommate who threatens someone within the dorm uh, there's someone 
for example, a neighbor, you know, in the dorms for sending threatening messages to the Zionist students or just really an intimidation coming from other students, just personally to the students, maybe, um, you know, if it's, a, I'm thinking like vandalism of some sort of their equipment, you know, maybe like something on the computer. So what would you say, is there anything to do that comes with this peer-to-peer -peer interaction when the aggression comes 100%. from another student? Yeah. Of course, I mean, I think a lot of it is coming from other students or student groups. Um, and we've dealt with harassment from one student to another student in a dorm. Uh, you've got to report it to the administration. You must report it to the administration. And if you have any worries or concerns about doing that on your own, that's something that ZOA can help you with. So come to us um, because it can be scary to come forward. I recognize that. We all do. Um, but you have to report it. You cannot feel afraid anywhere on your campus, but especially in your dorm. It's just unacceptable. And the school is obligated to protect you. Um, whether that means, I don't think it means inconveniencing you. I think that might mean inconveniencing your harasser and moving that student out of the dorm, punishing that student and imposing other consequences on that student. But by all means, that is something that you should not have to put up with. Um, and if you have any concerns about raising uh, that kind of problem, that's exactly the kind of thing you could come to us for help for. Now, another question, if you can speak a little bit about the difference between freedom of speech, right? That a lot of time on campuses, that's uh, what we hear. There is freedom of speech, there is academic speech and to when it crosses the line into unprotected hate speech. So how to differentiate between the two when we write letters to administration or when we try to submit a complaint? You know, it's it's so hard. It would be so hard for me to give you an exact answer to this question. When speech crosses the line into unprotected speech, um, what's free speech, what's not free speech. It's so complicated, but I, I will tell you this. OCR can enforce and must enforce Title VI without um, impinging on anyone's freedom of speech. And there are ways to enforce the law without impinging on free speech. And in fact, we make those recommendations at ZOA to schools all the time. Um, even if you're dealing with protected speech, and, and it's true that there's some hate speech that is protected speech, but some speech calling for the genocide of Jews, um, that's, that's, that's an obvious one to me. That is not protected speech in my judgment, and schools should be taking action. But even in the case of protected speech, speech that's protected under the First Amendment, there are so many things that schools can do short of censoring or suppressing the speech. For example, university leaders have their own First Amendment rights. We encourage them all the time. If there's speech on campus that is demonizing Israel, promoting lies about Israel and about Jews, exercise your own First Amendment rights. That is your moral obligation. Let your student body know that you condemn the hate speech. You recognize that students may have the right to say what they're saying, but you condemn it and it's against the values of the university and explain why it is so. That's a must. We also encourage schools to adopt what's called the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism or IRA. It's a great definition. It's internationally accepted. The United States government uses it. Many countries around the world use it and colleges and universities should use it too not as a punitive tool. This is what the people with the anti-Israel activists say, oh, Ira, it's gonna punish speech, it's gonna suppress speech. It does nothing of the sort. Asking colleges and universities to adopt the Ira definition 
is asking them to use the definition as an educational resource to staff, to students, to faculty, to administrators, to use it as a tool so that you can understand how anti-Semitism is expressed today. And the reason why this, this definition, this IRA definition is so important and so excellent is because it includes many contemporary examples of anti-Semitism, how anti-Semitism is being expressed today, including on our college campuses. Um, and a lot of those examples relate to Israel. And the definition is crystal clear. It says criticism of Israel that is lodged is this that is similar to the criticism that's lodged against any other country or nation is not anti-Semitic. But when Israel is singled out and held to a different standard, that's another story. And that's what the IRA definition makes clear. And we encourage colleges and universities all the time as one of the remedies, adopt the definition, educate staff and students about the definition. When you do mandatory training on bias and bigotry, include the IRA definition in your training because it's an excellent definition and it will help people understand how anti-Semitism is expressed today. Thank you. I'm really happy that you addressed the IRA definition because that was actually one of the questions too. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the IRA definition, it's not legally binding, but it's basically a really great tool. And if I'm not mistaken, um, most states or a lot of states adopted it. Uh, the Department of Education adopted it or right. Um, and the, the department, yes. I mean, the definition, Valeria, makes clear that it's I think it says it's a non-legally binding definition. Yeah. It doesn't hold itself out to be more than what it actually is. It's an educational resource and a tool. And you're right, it's been adopted by many states, towns, cities. Um, uh, the Department of Education uses it. In fact, uh, it was adopted. The Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights decided to use it um, as it was deciding one of the ZOA's Title VI cases against Rutgers University. It said that when we look at behavior to determine whether it's motivated by anti-Semitic bias, we're going to use the IRA definition. It's a tool um, and it has, it has no punitive impact. It's not the intent and that's not the effect. This is really important and also important, I think, to mention that it has nothing to do with um with stopping freedom of speech because a lot of times this is the objectives we see uh to the IRA definition. So I think all these examples, right. it's good to have all these examples as a um, you know, in a list maybe when trying to advocate for it for your school to adapt to this definition and to use it. And um, you know, I'll jump to another maybe from this a uh, quick question about DEI. So a lot of schools have this uh, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, groups that seem like they're actually not uh, very much including the Jewish voices. So I would say anything that you would um, recommend, maybe trying to ask the DEI committees to include the Jewish voices more. Is there any um, recommendation for that? That's the question. Well, I, I, I think even if these DEI initiatives, maybe they're well-intentioned, I'd like to assume that they're well-intentioned, I think they end up hurting Jews. Um, Jews typically are put in the category of, you know, the people in power, they're the oppressors, when we know we have a very, very long history of being persecuted and oppressed. But that's not the way that Jews are considered within the DEI framework. And I think one useful ask of these DEI initiatives is to, if you're going to, to have a DEI program at, at your school, you have to include anti-Semitism and you have to include anti-Semitism and use the IRA definition as a framework for understanding anti-Semitism. You know, I want to go back to something that you raised before about the First Amendment, because I, I didn't say this earlier, and I think it's important to point out, and this is 
this is my opinion based on my experience. Um, when we have raised at ZOA um, issues about anti-Semitism at various schools and um, universities, we we typically get a response. Oh, you know what we know is it's awful, but you know what? There's nothing that we can do. First Amendment. They have the right to say what they want to say. Um, but not too long ago, um, well, to me, there's a double standard in the way that colleges and universities um, apply the First Amendment when it comes to hate speech. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, a few years ago, I was in the New York Times. It got a lot of publicity. Um, there was a situation, I think it was at the University of Oklahoma, and there were um, a group of um, fraternity members. I think they were on a bus. Maybe they had a little bit too much to drink and they were singing and chanting and saying some really offensive things, um, including the N-word. And I think it took the president of the university about five minutes to, I think some students may have been expelled but students were punished immediately and the fraternity was thrown off the campus, even though the entire fraternity had not been involved in the offensive singing. Um, and the president of the university, I remember reading, he understood that these students were creating a hostile environment for other students, which would not be tolerated. Now, I'm not sure why that wouldn't have been considered protected speech. It's offensive, it's abhorrent to me, but nobody in particular was threatened. But yet in that context, when blacks were targeted, the university appropriately took action. I'm gonna give you one other example. A few years ago at Yale University, um, there were members of a fraternity who were out in, the, in a quad, one of the residential quads, and they were singing really offensive things about women horrible things that I, I can't condone and I'm not going to repeat. Once again, they cracked down. I'm pretty sure that it, it, the fraternity was, was expelled. I know that students were punished. The university responded with sanctions. Again, recognizing that the conduct, which I think could fall under protected speech, um, was offensive to women and created a hostile environment for women. So when women were targeted, the university cracked down. I'd like to see the same forceful response from colleges and universities when Jews are the targets. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that uh, you know a lot of the people here who are participating in this webinar and uh, just people in the community would love to see a response and waiting and not understanding why it takes so long for some university, uh, you know, presidents. And uh, we've seen the hearing in Congress of uh, the heads of uh, Ivy League schools that just cannot say that they clearly condemn certain actions and certain things, you know, against the Jewish and Zionist students on campus. So I think a lot of the people are uh, very, very much uh, in, in the same, you know, in the same uh, situation. Just it's unimaginable like what what is it so hard to to condemn this why is it so hard you know so i think um you know we do have a few more questions but i believe some of them are in a way repeating uh things that were already addressed um so one question here that maybe uh is somewhat different is um is there anything to consider in terms of jurisdiction so if i'm an out of town student uh or you know, I go just, uh, I'm in school for the semester, but then I go back. Is there an issue for me to file uh, a complaint against, uh, I don't know, like if someone threatens me on campus, is there any jurisdiction issue? I, I wouldn't think so. No, I mean, there are, there are, there are time limitations. So typically you have to file your complaint if you're filing with, with OCR, with the Office for Civil Rights, you have to file your complaint within 180 days of the alleged harassment or discrimination. And if there are extenuating circumstances, 
you can explain that to OCR, but typically it's that 180 degree, 180 day deadline. In terms of jurisdiction, no, there, there's no problem. I mean, you, if you go to school um, in New York, um, there's a New York regional office uh, for the for the Office for Civil Rights, or you can file the complaint at uh, at OCR headquarters in Washington D.C. They've actually made it very, very easy. I, I myself have never used the online complaint form. Um, when ZOA files a complaint, it's a very, very deliberately detailed letter setting forth what's happened and why uh, the conduct rises to the level of a legal violation. But you can use the form. Um, they're trying to make it user friendly um, and make it easier for students to come forward. And maybe um, just kind of coming to an end of the questions here, but how about um, high schools? So we're talking mostly on college campuses. What about high schools, maybe public or private high schools that have the same issues? Such a good question, Valeria. There was, um, there was a congressional hearing yesterday about um, the, the K through 12 schools where, you know, unfortunately these problems are seeping into those schools too. Um, and we we have a um, Title VI investigation going on right now against Fairfax County Public Schools, which is one of the largest public school districts um, in, in Virginia. And we just recently filed a complaint against Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland. I mean, the problems are horrific, you know, kids and I mean kids getting Heil Hitler salutes, um, swastikas all over the place, um, comments like dirty Jew, Jewish F, um, Jew boy, you're such a Jew, um, walkouts in the schools that make kids so afraid. These are walkouts. They're allegedly pro-Palestinian protests and walkouts but they're horrifically anti-Israel and sometimes anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish. And these walkouts have become so scary for students that they stay home from school on the day that these walkouts are, are going to occur. Um, and sometimes they've disrupted classes and normal school operations. So the hostilities that we've been seeing on college campuses now, unfortunately, they're seeping down into the lower schools. Um, and we're addressing those too. Yeah, it is very unfortunate. I would say that, uh, you know, in SSI too, we, ha we hear obviously mostly from college students, but also from high school students who do face uh, very similar issues to what is happening on colleges. And then um, the examples are just really heartbreaking sometimes of the things that students hear and uh, the messages they're seeing on campus, and then they still have to function and take their finals and study and do everything uh, as usual. But, yeah, you know, with that, I would say, you that, know, mm -hmm. go ahead, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I would just say, you know, that with that really uh, hard and difficult situation, it's uh, I think this presentation was extremely important because it gives at least the basics of understanding what are all these legal uh, ramifications, you know, what is Title VI that I think a lot of people hear about it recently, but they don't quite understand what exactly does it mean. So I think that's been a very uh, good educational uh, preview, you know, of what can be done or what are the resources for college students. So just wanted to thank you for that. I, I thank you for this. And, and I'll tell you that I've had many students over the years tell me that what is almost more painful to them on their campuses, it's not, it's just, it's not just the anti-Semitism that they're enduring, it's the indifference to the anti-Semitism that is almost more painful to them. The indifference from administrators. It, it, they're almost getting the message that the anti-Semitism is okay and look, you just have to deal with it. And, and the short answer is that you don't have to deal with it there are legal tools and there are legal remedies. Um, they may not be running as effectively as we would like, but we certainly are very persistent at ZOA. Um, we are here to help you. And for anyone 
who has a concern, a parent, a student, a community member, I mean this sincerely, please reach out to us. Um, I'm gonna give you my contact information again. Don't hesitate if you want any of the resources that we've talked about today, you know, the OCR letter that was issued a couple of days ago, you want a copy of the IRA definition, you want to talk about a problem that you're facing on your campus or maybe your child is, um, my number again is 212-481-1500. My email is stuckman at zoa.org. We are here to help, so please reach out. Thank you so much, Susanio. Thank you for what you're doing and what your team is doing. And thank you for uh, taking the time this afternoon to speak to us and to talk to the students and the parents and community members, some of them on the line to really um, highlight some of these legal issues, you know, concerning what's happening on campuses. And um, again, thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you for the great work that you and SSI are doing. It's really, it's a pleasure and an honor to partner with you. Thank you, Susan. Okay, thank you, thank everyone. You. I really appreciate you joining us and um, hopefully you took away some good, uh, you know, key points. And, um, you know, we, we will stay strong uh, and hopefully there will be a better, better year next academic year for the Jewish students and just for Israel and with our collective work, you know, target towards the administration. So uh, the college campuses, you know, and the students. So uh, really, thank you so much. Thank you.